Good morning. I like Travis. He made me laugh. So I'm, I'm trying to get my giggles out. Um, I, I felt like I might have been one of three who got the MC Hammer reference, which then, you know, I, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be 40. So that just really, when he did the hammer thing, and then I was like, wow, I'm going to be 40. So it kind of really hit just right now. So, um, but I'm honored to be here with you guys. I was here month, two months ago almost with my husband and you guys seem to really like him. So I'm hoping you'll really like me too. Uh, you know, some of you guys are talking to him in the corner and I was hungry and I couldn't leave. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I'm kidding, Pastor Joey. No, um, we had a wonderful time. Um, and, um, and you've also heard uh, one of our, our, our just dear heart sisters who's a part of our fellowship, Miss T. Faye Griffin. She was here, I don't know how long ago. And then she drove near San Diego, right? Somewhere near San Diego to the, to the other uh, location. And, um, and so she was telling us that story on the way. But isn't God awesome? I just, just so you know, I'm like completely ridiculously in love with God. It's, it's yeah, it's, um, it's intense. And um, so I love his word. I love his people. Um, I, I can't say that I, I ever thought that this was going to be my life. Um, you know, I had these big plans and, you know, I was going to be famous. Um, you know, most of us have had that plan one time or the next. And, you know, I was going to do all these great things. And so I would see glimpses um, of my future. Um, but I, I would always go, oh, yeah, I'm going to be doing that. And every glimpse was really this. Um, and so I was in Germany ministering um, when the Lord called me to speak, which I thought was the funniest thing. I had that Sarah moment, you know, when you tell when he told Sarah she was going to have a baby at 99, she was like, ha, ha. you know, I was the same way, like, you're going to preach. I was like, ha, ha, ha. you know, like, Lord, do you know, you've met me, right? Like, I don't know if you really want me to talk to people. Um, and he said it once, he said it twice. And the third time I knew. It was real, and everything after that changed. And so um, I've been in full-time ministry 14 years. That was 1999, and um, it has been an awesome time with the Lord. Um, I am also in love with my pastor, you know, because he's my husband. So <laughs> it's like the best line ever now. I can, you know, I'm not one of those stalker, you know, ladies that is, loves her pastor. I actually go with my pastor, you know. So, you know, you've met them. They're like, I love my pastor. You're like, that's a little much, but I, I love my pastor. So um, we have a great uh, life together serving in ministry and serving God's people. That is uh, our heart, is kingdom building and serving God's people. They asked me to sing, um, and I'm going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I want to get into the word first. Is that okay? And then I'll sing at the end. Um, uh, let's, uh, I love the word, so we're going to be in more than just one book of the Bible today. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So let's open our Bibles. Who's got a Bible, an iPhone, an iPad, a tablet, a, a Galaxy, a, you know, the Bible's on everything now. Isn't that awesome? So, but I still recommend owning like a Bible that you can touch and you can hold and you can make notes in, you know, because, you know, one day that tablet's going to die <laughs> and that iPad may blank out and all your wonderful notes and all those things you thought you had in backup uh, may not be there. But this right here will always be here. This is, um, I have about really I have over 30 different Bibles some of them are falling apart because I've written in them or read them so many times and um, now this one is not new <laughs> I just don't let anybody else touch it so um, it's like my it's like that you know that Bible when I graduated from Bible College my mother got me this Bible and I, I, I wanted this Bible if you want a great study Bible it's called the keyword and it is awesome just just anybody who wants like a really 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 good Bible it's pricey why so I had my mama buy it, but <laughs> I was like, I really want this Bible, but you know, I just got out of college, so I need you to buy my Bible, but um, it is an amazing, amazing Bible. We are going to be in two books of the Bible today. We're going to be in Luke, and we are going to be in Galatians, so let's turn. We're going to turn to Luke 10 and 2, and then if you want to put your hand in Galatians, we're going to be in Galatians 6 and 9. 
Luke 10 and Galatians 6. Luke 10 and Galatians 6. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. So Luke 10 and 2, you might have heard this before. Uh, it says, he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let's go to Galatians 6 and 9. Now, 6 and 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let's read it one more time. So Luke 10 and 2 says, He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen. 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 This is the word of the Lord. So um, let's stay. Where's Elizabeth? Where, where is she at? <laughs> Is she hiding in this room over here? Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth called me. Well, actually, she inboxed me yesterday on Facebook. And um, she, <laughs> she, she laughing. She inboxed me on Facebook and asked me to send my number. And when she called me um, later on in the day, she was telling me that she was not in the office. And she said something that led me to where we are today. She said, I'm out in the field. She said, I'm out in the field today, and so I'm not in the office. And so she said it. As soon as she said it, the Lord said, write it down, and I wrote it down. So today I want to talk to you about out in the field, okay? So we read in uh, Luke 10 and 2 um, about this, this harvest, that there, are, there is a, a, a place that is plentiful, but the workers, the laborers, the people that God needs are few. It really baffles me that in 2014, this scripture is very relevant. There is a harvest. There is a big field. There is a great world out here that is waiting for the sons of God to rise up. It says that the world is praying for us to rise up. And so here's this great land. But the Lord says, but the laborers are few. So he says, ask, he literally says, ask to be sent out into this harvest. And so uh, I love words. Um, I, I love God's words. And so as I was studying out this scripture, the word ask uh, means what we know, uh, prayer and, and supplication. But it also meant that it was something, uh, this ask was given because it was necessary to be done. In God's eyes, this was a must. It was a necessity. It was a request that had to be made. And so we, as God's people, God says that he knows everything that we have need of. But he, what does he say? He says, but still ask me. And so he says, I know that there's a need for laborers. But I'm asking you to request of me because it's necessary that I get you in position to be the one to go. And a lot of times what we're doing is we're praying that God would send anybody but us. Right? We're, we're, we're praying for the missionaries and we're praying for the evangelists and we're praying for our pastors and we're praying for the prophets and the apostles and every, every ministry auxiliary, the women's ministry, the men's ministry, the children's ministry. And we're always praying that God would bring somebody to help them, but we never say, God, send us to be the help. And so instead of wanting to be out in the field, we want to be sitting in the pew. But what do bench warmers do? They keep the bench warm. But God is saying, I need you to request of me to be sent out because it's a necessity because my harvest needs laborers. There is a harvest. And until we recognize and realize that there's a harvest, we will remain complacent and, be and bench warmers. And so the next part, it says, it says that not only ask, but then I want to send you out 
Now, a lot of times when we think about sending, you know, we think about how we, you know, we send emails now. You know, so easy. You just type in, enter, and it's gone. Or, you know, back in the day, we used to actually write letters to people, and we'd put it in the mail. It took a little longer, but it got there, and there was something personal about that. But um, it's not in the sending of you um, sending something, but in this text, sending means that you actually would be brought out, that you would be set somewhere, and then that you would be removed from where you are. See, a lot of us think that the harvest is where we are. But God says, I need to move you from where you are to where the harvest is. And see, a lot of us keep our eyes so focused on the temporary things. But God says that his, his house, his kingdom is eternal. There is a big field. There is a big world. Um, I come from Northern California originally. I've lived all over. I've lived in, out of the country. I've lived in other states. Um, I've been in the East Coast. But in uh, Northern California, it, um, this, you know, I don't know if it's the same as Southern. You guys know, I mean, we're four and a half hour drive from each other, uh, 45 minutes on a plane, but we don't actually go to each other's places. You know, it's like, um, when I first came to LA, I was like, this, this is just the craziest place I've ever been. You know, um, in, in Northern California, you know, we mean what we say, you know, we do what we say. Nobody's trying to be anybody else, you know, out here, not y'all, but out here. Um, <laughs> It might be you, but I'm just in case it's in case it's you, it's not you. But you know, out here, everybody's trying to be somebody else. You know, so it's like the first time I, I lived here, I met this guy. This was before I was married, and me and my girlfriends were out, and this group of guys came up to us, and we were talking to them, and I said, "Well, what do you do for a living?" He said, "I'm a lawyer." I was like, "Wow, that's amazing." He said, "But I'm a sp I'm an aspiring novelist." I was like, "So why don't you just write a book?" <laughs> I said, "You went to school all that time, but in your heart of hearts." You want to be a writer? I don't, I don't even understand that. You know, and everybody's an actor, everybody's a dancer, everybody's a singer, even if they got talent or not. Everybody is something. And God is trying to get us to realize that we in the kingdom are something too. And that there is a necessity for us to be removed, to be brought out, to be set in the harvest, in the field, because it is a must. You are a necessity in the kingdom. And a lot of times we feel that we're, you know, our position or our role is very small because we don't have the title. Well, here's what I've come to tell you. If you have the title but no work behind it, the title means nothing. Amen. And so the thing is, God says, I'm looking for laborers. I'm not looking for titles. He didn't say I'm looking for pastors. He didn't say I'm looking for ministers. He said, I'm looking for laborers. And there is a, a specific type of person that is a laborer. It's a person that is ready and willing to be removed from wherever they currently are to go where he wants to come set on, them. Come on. Okay? So that's what Luke is telling us. But then we go over to Galatians. And we've heard this scripture, do not become weary in doing good. How many of us have heard that before? How many of us have said that when we're on this journey of life and something is difficult and we're like, oh, Lord, let me not be weary in my, in my well-doing. Okay, Father. Oh, God, I'm growing weary. I'm growing faint. Well, a lot of us, we get weary and, uh, well, let me say this, we get burned out and we think that that's weary. That's not the same thing. You are burned out because you burdened yourself with things that are not your own. I'll say that again. You're burned out because you burdened yourself with things that are not oh, your own. Oh. When you are weary, it says don't be weary in doing good. Mm -hmm. So weary in that, in that text means don't become defeated in your spirit. You know, when we think about weary, we think we're tired. You know, our bones are hurting. We've gone the distance too long. And what he's saying is don't, don't, don't get discouraged in your spirit, man. It also means uh, to, to don't give in to trouble. Let me tell you who gave in to trouble. Aaron gave in to trouble when Moses went up to the mountain. And all of, you know, I'm going to use us. All of us was at the bottom. And we were like, where he at? Come on, Aaron. Do something for me. You know, he done went away and we don't have nothing. We're tired. We're hungry. You know, they thought they were weary, but they were burnt out. <laughs> and so Aaron got consumed by the people and began to have them burn gold, and he made this calf. And God gets angry. And then Moses, who was supposed to enter into the promised land, he got defeated in spirit by the people. And so at the end of his journey, he did the opposite of what God wanted him to do. Instead of speaking, he struck again. And a lot of us have gotten to that place 
where we think we know God so tough. People have consumed us and their, their words and, and, and what they want, and we've become defeated in spirit, and we have lost the race. But God is saying, don't get defeated in your spirit. Remember who I am on the journey. See, the thing is, if God, if you're not carrying burdens of other people, then you can carry the weight of his glory. Come on, come on. And you can endure the journey ahead. Uh, it says, don't be weary in doing good. Now, a lot of us think that we're, we're good. You know, how many people have met the people who think they're good, so because I'm good, I'm going to heaven? You know? Uh, I, me too. I was like, man, I'm good. You know, I'm nice. <laughs> I ain't killed nobody. You know what I mean? You line all these things up. I go to church. And the difference was I went to church, but I had no relationship with Jesus when I was young. I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't know him. I knew of him because my mother told me. I knew of him because the pastor told me. I knew of him because, you know, I sang in the choir. But I had no personal relationship with him. And so what I was doing was I was doing the activities of church, but I was not doing good. And so in the scripture, doing good means is to produce. <laughs> so when you're doing good, this, it says that you will ha it, there will be an obvious produce, uh, it will be obvious what you're producing. So you will bring about something. You will make something happen because you're doing good, not on your own strength and not for your own selfish gain, but for the Lord. And so we've heard, uh, you know, how many times have, have people said something to you and you said, well, just look at my fruit. <laughs> or we've told other people, well, look at their fruit. We're able to distinguish whose we are and where we are by the fruit that is produced in our lives. So I can tell you, uh, you know, and this is not arrogant, this is not boastful, but I can tell you where you are in your life by the fruit that you're producing. And so he says in doing good, you need to be producing fruit that will remain that looks like God. So in the harvest of God, there is not rotten fruit. In the harvest of God, fruit is not spoiling. In the harvest of God, fruit is ripe, it's producing, it's growing, and it's multiplying. Come on. And so every time God's fruit is planted, every time that you are doing good, there is a duplication, a multiplication, and a replication of him and his glory. And so we continue, and it says, in doing good. Good in this scripture, I know that we just think doing good is being nice and being kind. It means teaching what is good having an influence or an effect on the lives of others. If you are continuing to influence people to hell, you are in the wrong lane. I know this could sound a little tough, but I, I really love the word of God, so I, I can only tell you what the word says, right? Right. This, I, I really don't have an opinion. I'm telling you what the word says. And a lot of us don't realize that we're in the wrong lane. We're on the broad road, and we're supposed to be on the narrow road. That's right. That's right. Everything is available to us. Everything is open to us, not unless God opens the door. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the enemy has deceived us and has allowed us to believe that we're producing good fruit. But when we turn around, we realize that everything has died around us. But God is calling the laborers to come into his harvest. And so what uh, I started to think about when I th thought about out in the field, I used to play softball. Anybody play baseball, softball, ladies, softball? Hey, there you go. Um, I played softball. Now that I'm old enough, I, I don't know why I played softball, but I played every sport and I did everything, but I played softball. And I pitched and I played in the outfield. I was an outfielder. You see, I'm very depressed by that. Who, who was the outfielder? Anybody play? Yeah, okay, you guys probably loved it, but I, I'm going to be really, I, I did not like being in the outfit, right? Not at all. And so I thought about it and, and how much I disliked it, you know. But what I thought about is for those who are in the outfield, one of the things is, is that we have the greatest perspective of the game because we can see everything. We can see everything happening. We understand the climate and the conditions around us. We can see the t what, when the clouds are coming over. We can see when, when things are happening, when people are about to steal bases. We can see everything. And so we have a greater ability to see and a greater perspective. Um, uh, but if there were no, you know, if there were only grounders or buns or 
uh, uh, or, or hits that were only going into the infielder, we have no action. You're just, you're out there. It was hot, you hot. It was cold, you cold. You're just there. But what I realized was even though I was there and there was no action, I had to be ready and I needed to be alert. Because at any moment, the game could change. At any moment, uh, 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 something could come my way. And if I was not ready, I would either get hit, hurt, or in danger. I'd be in danger. And the thing is, is that um, uh, outfielders, I love them, they're defensive. The position is a defensive position. See, the infielders play offensively, but the outfielders play defensively. And a lot of us have not learned to armor ourselves as we go out and God calls us out into the field. We have not become defensive players. And so what happens if, if you're not a defensive player, you will be an offended person. And so people are easily offending you and all you're trying to do is do good, but you are in the wrong position and the wrong posture. See, God says, I need laborers to go into the harvest, into the field. I need people who are ready, ready to be removed, ready to be set, ready to produce, ready to plant and ready to help me grow this kingdom. And if you're ready to go and to grow, then you've always got to be ready and you've got, got to always have to be alert because I'm sending things your way that you've never seen before. But Come I've on. equipped you and I've called you Come to on. be ready to endure. Come on. And so in Luke, before that scripture happens where he says he's talking about the harvest, he's talking to the disciples. And it says right before that in verse one that he's about he sent them out two by two and he tells them you're about to go out and there's about to be some things, but I'm sending you into the harvest. And then he says, and when you get there, meet them with peace. And if they don't greet you with peace, you know what? Kick the dust off your feet and keep it moving. And what happens to us is we think that once God sets us in the harvest, it's our harvest. And so then we get comfortable in our harvest and we start to plant seeds that we want to plant and we start to do things how we want to do it. We water the, 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 we water the seeds sometimes and, 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 and sometimes we till the soil and sometimes we do this and sometimes we do that. But when you are in the kingdom and you are in the harvest of the Lord, it's 24 hours, it's 24 hours seven days a week. It never stops because we are building, we are helping God to build his kingdom here on earth. And so one of the things that I, as I continue to, to remember being an outfielder, um, I started to look up the outfielder and their positions. And did you know, I didn't even know there were numbers that were equated to the outfielders. So it said, you know, you have the left, you have the right, and you have center. I was a left fielder, but you have these three positions. It says that the left fielder's number is seven, the right is nine, and the center is eight. Well, seven means completeness, nine is the fruit of the spirit, and eight is new beginnings. So when you go into the harvest, God is sending you to complete a thing. When you go out into the harvest, God wants you to do what? Walk in the fruits of the spirit so that you can multiply in other people the fruits of the spirit. And when you are in the harvest, it's a new beginning, not just for you, but for everybody else that's coming with you. And so we need to be prepared and excited that we're about to be outfielders. There may not always be a whole bunch of action, but there will be a whole lot of praying. There'll be a whole lot of power and there'll be a whole lot of his presence. And so we got to say, are we ready to be that labor? Are we ready? Because it says there's only few, but ask me, it's a necessity that you go. So are you ready to get out of your comfort zone? Mm, you know, are you ready to get up off the couch? Stop watching, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, all the wives. Stop watching all them, all them wives. Don't watch them. Reality TV, you know, we have gotten sucked into reality TV and it's all scripted. I'm like, why, why are we all think that this is real? You know, uh, when, when, the ones I watch, I watch when I'm about to try to go to sleep. Because it's, it's just dead television. I mean, it's, it's no, I don't got to think about this. I can tell you what's going to happen before it's going to happen. But we're consumed by our comfort. And one thing that my husband says, and it is the truth, and you can read it from Genesis to Revelation, God does not work in your comfortability. He doesn't. If he worked in mine, I would not be sitting in front of y'all. <laughs> I, am, I am naturally, and my DNA is an, my, my flesh DNA, I'm an introvert. 
I like to be at home. I do not have to ever see people and I would be fine. I had this life made, you know, I was going to write books and I was going to sell CDs and in 20 years I was going to come out like Prince and then, you know, excuse me, and for, you know, and then I was going to be on this talk show and they were going to be like, oh my gosh, you're a woman. Oh my gosh, you're black. I'd be like, I know. I, I just, I know. You didn't have no idea. Because I've been a hermit all these years. You know, I would have been anything. My name, they don't know, you know, anything. And I just, I, that was my life I wanted. And God said, no, I, 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 need, uh, I need someone to go out into the harvest. And I said, oh, okay. Because I told the Lord that whatever he asked me to do, I would do it. And literally, everything he's asked me to do, I've done it. And there have been days I was like, why did I say that? Because I meant it. Because I love God enough that I would do anything that he tells me to do. I don't even care how crazy it looks. Because at the end of the day, if I'm going for him, then he's going to make provision for me. And he's going to cover me. But I'm ready to go back into the field. You know, a lot of us want to be in the front, but we don't know the power of being the outfielder. We don't know the power of being on the left, on the right, or in the center. We don't realize that we are a doorway to somebody's new beginning, somebody's entrance into, you know, this great gift of salvation, somebody's doorway into an introduction to Jesus, someone's, you know, opportunity to 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 repent and turn. We're that new beginning for someone. For, for some of us, some of us are, are walking someone into their completion. We're helping them to finish the race. You know, how many of us have started things and never finished? You know, and we've taken that attitude into our Christianity. And we can't do that. We've got to finish this race. We've got to run it with all endurance. We cannot grow weary. We cannot fade. We cannot give up. We cannot quit. We cannot quit on people. We cannot quit on God. We cannot quit on ourselves. And then some of us are going to be able to plant that fruit of those fruits of the spirit, that fruit of joy, love, patience, peace, gentleness, kindness, uh, faithfulness, and, 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 and long suffering or, or forbearing. Those nine gifts of the spirit that all of us should be walking in and should be activated in our lives at all times. And sometimes, you know, in our weariness, in, in that place of being defeated, because, you know, I used to, when early on in ministry, you know, I was just, you know, I'm still kind of a go-getter, um, but I wanted to save everybody. You know, when you, you know, you first come to Jesus, you want everybody to get saved. You know, you know oh God, we get saved them all, Lord. You know, and I still have that hunger, but I have wisdom. So, I, you know, I will be walking with people, and I would tell them, you know, and then they do what they want to do. And I'd be like, oh, my God, they didn't get it. You know, and I'd be crying to the Lord. I told them, I gave them, you told me to plant seeds, and I did, they don't want you. Oh, my God. You know, and he was like, people are going to do what people want to do. He said, what does my word say? And I was like, one plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. So he said, if you never see the increase, if you plant it or you water it, that's all I ask you to do. Stop getting so consumed. You ain't the savior. <laughs> I'm like, you're so right. And it freed me. It freed me. And so with that, when we go into the outfield, we've got to be set ready to move when the action comes and ready to catch whatever God throws and to catch whoever God gives. Because a lot of us have caught people, but we've dropped them. We've dropped them off and we've left them. But when we go into the harvest, it's so that we can make other disciples, so that we can multiply and duplicate and grow the kingdom of God because he's coming back. And he's coming not for your church, my church, whatever local assembly you attend. He says, I'm coming back for a bride without spot and without blemish. And that bride is us. The church is the people. And so even right now, because we are the church, we're doing what the Bible says, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. We've come together. And so anytime we're coming together in his name, not our name, not for our own glory, but for his name then we are beginning to look like the laborers he wants to send. Amen? Amen? So let's pray. God, I just thank you and I praise you because we want to be those laborers, God. We want to be those that you send out in the field, ready, God, excited. Those, God, who will produce. Those, God, who will 
be willing to be sent out, to be removed, to be brought into a position and a place that only you can bring us to. God, we thank you that we will not be defeated in our spirit, that God, we will not let our flesh rise up and take control, but we will let the divine nature inside of us, like the divine nature that rose up inside of our Savior at Gethsemane, we will let those words come out of our mouth, not our will, but your will be done. We thank you, God, that we will ask you because it is a necessity that God laborers go. We're not going to ask for Joe down the street or Martha up the way. We're going to ask that you send us, God, us personally, Lord, because there is a necessity. There is a need for each and every one of us because, God, you said that this body is made up of many members. And so, God, we are the members of your body. And one of us is the hand, and one of us is the eye, one of us is the ear, one of us is the nose, one of us is the legs, one of us is the feet, and you need us all to work together. So send us out, God. Remove us, God, from this place of complacency. Let us no longer just want to be bench warmers, but let us get in the game. Let us play, God, with all endurance, all tenacity. God, we thank you that we will do good. We will teach the good news. We will influence and we will affect this world for you. God, we will all be agents of change and people will come to know that Jesus Christ, the Savior, still lives and still reigns. So we thank you, God, that we're going out in the field. We're following after you, serving you with everything we have, loving you with our whole heart, all of our mind and all of our strength. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So now I got to do what I said I do, right? I got to sing. Okay. She's like, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, let's sing. Let's sing. Let's sing. Oh, right, 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 right. You know what? I really don't. They'll hear me. I promise. You can turn this off too, unless you need to record it. <laughs> do you need to record it? <coughs> I, I, I'll be obedient. So you want to turn that off? Yes, green light is on. This one's off? Okay. Um, let's just close our eyes. Let's just worship God for a minute. Father, how we praise you. How we love you. You are so awesome. Just awesome. God, I'm just so grateful for your presence here today. Thank you for Trinity, God. For a place, Lord, where your workers can come and fellowship. Can connect with you on a daily basis. Where prayers are lifted and petitions are made where you are honored, where you are glorified, where you are the center. God, this is a special place. And I ask that you would continue to cover it. Touch it, oh God. Touch each and every person. Move even through the aisles right now, God. Fill us up, God, till we're overflowing. Protect and guard this beautiful, wonderful place, God, that you created. Bless God the head of this, of this local assembly, of this body. Continue to influence him and empower him with more energy, more vision, more tenacity. Give him more grace, for your grace is sufficient. Touch the prayer warriors here, God. Continue to grow each and every one of us up, God, in you. God, let us never grow weary, even in the things that seem mundane. God, this place is reaching the world. And so we're asking, God, that you would just continue to allow your spirit to rule and to reign here. Because you're God. Because you are just God. You're just God. And that's enough, Lord. You don't have to do anything. You're God. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which means you're the God of promises. You're the God of miracles. You're the God that delivers. You're the God that heals. You're the God that restores. You're the God that sets free. You're God. And so we thank you and we praise you this morning. And God, just even out of our own lips right now, we each just tell you how much we love you. We just take this opportunity, God, to just connect with you individually, personally, just to say thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. From the fruit of our own lips, God. We don't need any rock to cry out for us. We cry out to the living God. We cry out to the Holy One. We, the creation, worship you, our creator. And we lift up your name, O oh God. You're worthy. You're worthy, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on Calvary's cross. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living on the inside of each of us. Thank you for guiding, leading our lives. Oh, how worthy, worthy, worthy. Thank you, God. Thank you for your presence even now. Thank you for your sweet presence, for your kindness and your gentleness, for your mercy. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for changing our DNA. Thank you for giving us new names, a new character, a new walk, a new talk, a new disposition, a new attitude. We thank you that old things have passed away and the new has come. We are new creatures in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's just worship. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Yo, thank you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 